Hey, good afternoon, everyone. I'm pleased to introduce my student, Karamar Vesma Maldonado. Uh, the talk that she's giving today represents a portion of the work she's completed for her uh, MS degree, and the final version of her master thesis will be available later this spring. Kari earned her BS from the University of Puerto Rico in Mayaguez in May of 2016, and uh, MS in Atmospheric Science at the University of Nevada, Reno. She arrived here in fall of 2018. Uh, prior to arriving here, she's had a variety of research experiences, REU-like experiences, as well as internships with NASA and NOAA labs. Um, and she's been also um, intimately involved with a number of our internal department efforts regarding uh, DEI. She served on the DEI uh, committee. And she's also a student lead ambassador for the AMS committee for Hispanic and Latinx uh, advancements, CHALA. She's also a member of the AMS Mind the Gap committee, which is organized around the question of an academic department's programs work with the private sector for our students for a wide range of career opportunities. Today, Kari will be talking about an exciting contribution she's made, and that is the ensemble prediction system for the work model based on singular vectors. I was thinking about the scope of the work she's done over the last uh, several months and uh, the last couple of years, and I realized that, you know, I could not have imagined undertaking a project of this when I was a graduate student. Um, and even much less when I perhaps arrived here as a faculty member, sort of envisioning trying to figure out how to put all these pieces together for this um, particular ensemble prediction system. So it's really quite an achievement. I'm excited to see her give this presentation today and for all the questions. Unfortunately, I'm going to have to step out slightly before the end of this, but this will be a great talk. So thank you very much and welcome, Kari. Not welcome, you're probably been here, but <laughs> it's all yours. Thank you. Um... Good afternoon, everyone. Today I will be presenting the work that consists in a single vector ensemble prediction system using the work model. This project was actually funded by the American Family Insurance Company because they were interested in, um, in use numerical weather prediction sample forecast to predict weather events for, for their for the hampers. So the objectives of this project are not two. The number one is to evaluate the feasibility of the singular vector technique using the work model to create initial condition perturbation for a short range example weather predictions. By feasibility, I mean this fast enough and we can apply this in a real time. The second objective would be to determine the forecast uncertainties for a given, given work forecast using the singular vector example. So the motivation of this work is because forecasting still remains a challenge due to the different factors. Number one would be to the imperfect knowledge and representation of a numerical weather prediction model, dynamics and physical processes, that uncertainty in initial conditions that can generate significant uncertainty even for a short range forecast. So to address this problem, we're gonna use an example forecast because one deterministic um, numerical weather prediction model cannot provide such information, but a collection of forecast models can provide the, the associated uncertainty with a forecast. So there are different types of example forecasts. There are one based in the initial conditions, others in modern physics, and others in computer models. For this project, we are going to focus just in the initial and moderate conditions. So what we want to create here is a system where we where we have the contra perturbation, the black dot to, pro, to produce a contra forecast, and then the plot time that represent the perturbing initial conditions to um, produce or generate a perturbed forecast. So usually the first step is just to apply random perturbation to the model. But by doing that, applying just random initial perturbation, it will show any, if any row away from the contra forecast, as we can observe here with the pink circle. So for that reason, many model integrations are required to identify those durations in the phase space of the model, where initial condition uncertainty might grow the fastest. So there are different types of example methods. I'm gonna discuss just the most uh, common method that we use. The first one is the example Kalman filter. And this method consists in virtual observations to generate an ensemble of analysis. So this method is mostly a statistical approach in where we wrote the uncertainties of the forecast. And this method is used in the Canadian Metrological Center and in the Hungarian Metrological Services. The other method that is commonly used is the singular vector. This method 
estimate the fastest growing perturbations for our specific time interval. So this approach is most a dynamically approach. Um, it will identify the dynamic structure or the dynamic growing uh, structure or dynamic growing perturbations in the in the forecast. And this method is used in the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecast. So since we are interested in identifying this growing perturbation or dynamic growing perturbations, we are gonna use the singular vectors in it. Just to give you a better description or more details about how this technique works, I'm gonna stop it. Let's just discuss it. So this technique we reveal which initial condition certainties will grow gradually to have an impact on the forecast. Like for example, here we have the initial conditions, and for a short period of term, a short evolution, um, we're, gonna, we're gonna see that the em em envelope of the perturbation will their form into a leaf, how we are observing here. So this axis that we are observing here, the thin arrows, represent the direction of the maximum growth for a short period of time. So so summarizing, we have initial, uh, initially uniform uh, amplitude, amplitude set of perturbation from the control analysis, and that they form into a leaves, right? So the way that this works, we have the initial condition perturbation to the control trajectory that are defined as X naught prime, and the linearized model L, then the evolved initial condition perturbation will be X, X time prime equal to L, the operator L, equal, uh, sorry, the operator L times X naught prime. So it's important to mention here that during this short period of time, the dynamics might be approximated as nearly linear. So we're gonna use the information that we define here to define this ratio, the ratio of the final time amplitude of the perturbations to the initial time. So we're gonna, uh, we're gonna use this information to create this ratio and we want to maximize this ratio. To maximize this ratio, uh, then we have that leaves us with an eigenvalue problem. And this is what we want to solve. To solve this eigenvalue problem, we need to use the following few tools and define the following three requirements. So first, we need access to an iterative eigensolver Langsas algorithm. We need the tangent linear model and the adjoint model of the nonlinear system. And we need to define a measure of amplitude, optimization time interval, and local projection operator. So first, let's just describe each one of them. The first one, we need an iterative eigensolver Langsas algorithm. These, we're gonna use this algorithm to solve for this eigenvalue problem. In this case, to solve for the initial perturbation. So this is the eigenvalue problem that I showed before. And L, where L is the matrix operator and LT is the transpose of L. So we are talking here about a huge multidimensional problem that where LT L is equal to around 300,000 by 300,000 elements. So if we're gonna compute this in a computer, it will exceed the memory that a computer can hold. For that reason, we need to find an LT L matrix representation. And the way to do that, we have that L is defined as an operator, where L represents the tangent linear model and LT the adjoint model. So what we have done is we have developed a code that iterates multiple times to reveal the singular vectors and to find the next larger singular vector. So now that I already mentioned the tangent linear model and the adjoint model, and one of them talk about how we're gonna apply this into, into, into the simulation to find the similar vectors. So the eigenvalue vectors of LTL are the left and the right similar vectors of L. And the eigenvalues of LTL are the squares of the singular values. So we have here our orthogonal, our orthogonal vectors, and we apply the tangent linear model that is represented by these a, a, a operator, we find the left singular vectors. After that, we apply the adjoint model and we find the right singular vectors and the square of the singular values. So again, we have at the final time, we have this axis 
that represents the direction of the maximum growth over the short period of time. So summarizing here, we need the tiny linear model that runs forward in time and the adjoint model that runs backward in time. So after we define, uh, use this, these two tools, we proceed to define the first um, no, different requirement. It's a norm. The norm is because the magnitude of the perturbation is defined by this norm. This is a function that assigns a positive lens to vector from a space of vectors. So the norm can be defined as the inner product and is expressed in this way where E is a matrix operator that defines the specific form of the inner product. So the most commonly norm that is used in the field is the total energy, and it's expressed like this bar code that we are observing here, and it's split in three different terms. The first one is the kinetic energy, the second one is available, available potential energy, and the third one is the elastic energy. The second requirement to define is a time. We need to identify a time or interval of time in which the initial perturbations maximize the growth. So for the purpose of for this project, we define or we define or select optimization growth over 25 or for, or a 25 five hours period. And when we assume that uncertainty continue growing beyond that time. The last to define would be the local projection operator. So we define this LPO, or we define it for sure, and we use it to define or obtain the similar vectors over a hierarchically restrictive region. So that, that region would be this blue box that we observe here, and the way that it works is that it will set the vector to have zero values outside that domain. So that means that this gold box will be set to zero, except this blue area that this is our region of interest. So, for example, another important um, factor or point um, about defining a local projector operator is that it will be a, it will be to avoid certain uncertainty for other weather events. So, for example. So we have an event occurring over here, um, but we also have another in, in intense event occurring over that part of the domain. By setting a specific area, it will be a, it will be avoiding the uncertainties for this or the perturbation that grow for this event to affect the uncertainties of the growth for that event that we are interested to focus on. So we now we have defined the uh, oh, the five issue, the five on um, the requirements that we need to calculate a similar vector using the work model. So after that, we got our similar values and our similar vectors, and we use that information to create the initial condition or create an example of the initial condition perturbations. So this example member are constructed by adding and subtracting each condition or each perturbation or initial condition perturbations from the control forecast using the following approach. We have here when we add the perturbation, we have the S N positive um, would be equal to X naught, so this would be the control forecast, plus the N D N that is representing the N perturbations, and if we have an arbitrary number that alpha is, sorry, we have a scaling factor where alpha is an arbitrary number, and this is a ratio where this one, the sigma to the square one, is the least singular value, and this one would be the next singular value. So this is the approach that we are using to add the perturbations, and this one over here would be to subtract the perturbation. So after we calculate or estimate our perturbations, the nonlinear integration are performed using the same initial time and the same parent domain. So at the end, we're going to have an experiment that comprise 2n plus 1, where one of the forecast is the con one is the contract forecast, and the rest will be the perturb analysis. So to give you a little bit overview, um, I'm not going to be in detail, but this is the case that, that we are going to be discussing today. This is not any extreme event. 
This is just an event that we are using just to test um, the single vector technique by using the, the, the war model. So this is an astrotopical cyclone that occurred in from December 4 to December 5th of the 2020. And what we observe in here, we have the sea level pressure, the near surface wind, and the potential temperature. So we had a 24 hours uh, evolution of the system. We can see that the baroclinic, the growth of the baroclinic is over US and he moved along the East Coast. So we can observe that here in the last 12 hours, how this cyclone developed and, and intensified over the East Coast of US. So having that in mind, we then proceed to define two sets of experiments. So we have, uh, for both experiments, we have a resolution of 90 kilometers with 41 vertical levels and 70 by 48 weak points using an initial time from December 4 at 12 UTC, the same optimization time of 24 hours. We used the, a norm, the dry en energy norm that we defined earlier. This norm has the kinetic energy, the potential temperature, and the perturbation, the surface pressure perturbations. So the only difference between the experiment number one and experiment number two is that in the experiment number one, we calculate the singular vectors over the entire domain. But for the experiment number two, so for the entire domain, I mean this whole black box that we are observing here. And for the experiment number two, we calculate the similar vectors just only using this uh, red box. For both, we iterate for um, we did we did it for 100 iterations. So the first result when we compare the eigen values that were accepted, um, one of the first thing to observe here is that the order of magnitude seems to be consistent for both. The only um, maybe a small difference is that the value is slightly smaller. And also, um, the, for the spray, when we add the LPO, that is the maroon color or the brown, brown color, it seems to converge faster than for when we don't have the LPO. Why is that? It's because we have a, we select a smaller area, we have a smaller domain, and that's why it converges faster and why we have slightly smaller values over over that region. So we, um, the, another point to mention, we got more ion bodies for the, when we add the LPO, and around 29 ion bodies were accepted when we add the LPO, and around 24 when we include the entire domain. So one important point to mention here is that the value that we are observing here represents the ratio of the final energy to the initial energy. So. Um, for here, we for this uh, the, for the results that we are going to be discussing today, we are going to use only the first ten. Why? Because usually the rap, the growing or the growth of the perturbations are more observed in the first ten eigen bodies. So, in the future or for the future world, will be to implement or to add the rest of the eigen value just to see if we add any value to our output. But for now, we are going to only concentrate in the first 10. So that means that we're going to have an experiment of 20 per two assembled members and one contra forecast. So a total of 21. With that in mind, we are going to discuss the result. We're going to uh, split it in three different sections. And so we're going to be discussing the structure and characteristics of the similar vectors, the assembled predi assemble prediction system, and estimate of probability. And we're going to do that for different variables to, just to compare how they may differ um, depending on the variable. So I'm going to start with the temperature. So we are going to observe the temperature. These are the perturbations, temperature perturbations at mean level. What we are observing here, we have the initial perturbations here to the right and the bulk perturbation to the left. So when we compare it, it's experiment number one and experiment number two, we observe that they're very, they seem to be to be very consistent. The only big or largest difference between them is that we are seeing larger perturbations over Texas, something that we are not observing here with experiment number two. And that might be because, again, we select a specific area for experiment number two. So when we observe the evolved perturbations, we are observing here that most of the evolved perturbations are over the north, 
east or, or east coast of US. So when we look now the magnitude, they are very small magnitude. We have we are talking about 0 0.002 Kelvin of perturbations. So that might bring the question. Can initial temperature perturbations around 0 0.002 Kelvin generate meaningful spread in a 24-hour forecast? So to answer this question, and like the answer will be yes. And I'm gonna show first the mean and the standard deviation for this variable. This is the temperature at point 0.850 eta level. And so we have here the mean to the right and the standard deviation to the left. So when we observe the, the mean, we are actually observing that they seem to be consistent for both experiments. But when we compare the standard deviation, we are seeing a completely different scenario here. So the variation for experiment number two are larger and broader, uh, and way broader in area and space. So, yeah. So the question would be why we are observing this, and we define that error to calculate the similar vectors. So. If you're wondering what would be the impact of including in the LPO, this is a good example because we are not seeing for when we include the LPO, most of the variants are concentrated or close to the area of that when we select the LPO. But when we select the entire domain, we are seeing the variance spread over the entire domain. And that's explained why we are seeing more variance over the northern part of Mexico and southwest of Texas, something that is missing in the experiment number two. So when we come um proceed to keep analyzing different parameters we proceed to analyze the a50 end of a thought zero degrees celsius axial term so why is this relevant this is relevant because this output will help to determine the forecast of precipitation time and also the location of this isotherm isotherm can have an impact in the in the location or the area that we are talking about and here in the east coast US, we are talking about about, about large cities so the most, the location of this isotherm can influence have a large influence depending on the location so here we have this is only the the final time that we're looking here and the black line represent the contour forecast and we have just two random example members here and when we have the blue line, um, it seems to be very consistent uh, with the contour forecast and the same for the experiment number two. What's interesting to look for the other ensemble member, the polar red, is that it seems to have more threat about the location. It seems to be polar inland compared with the contour forecast. And for the experiment number two, it also polar inland, so it's a little starter to to southern compared with experiment number one here. But since this doesn't say much, we proceed to plot all the sample members. So what we see here, a spaghetti plot, practically, um, experiment number one seems to be more of a lapping of, with the contour forecast. But with experiment number two, what we are observing is that um, the area is a little broader compared with the, with the experiment number one. Oh. Experiment number one. But again, it doesn't say much. So we proceed to estimate the probability, the percentage probability to have to predict the temperature below zero degree Celsius. So here is experiment number one, experiment number two. Again, this is the final time. And yeah, we are not seeing a big difference, at least by eye. Um, so we then proceed to calculate the difference between them just to have a clear view of this. Also, what we're observing here is the red uh, represents the air, red areas are suggesting that experiment number one is al around 20% more likely to predict temperature below zero degrees Celsius. And the blue areas are indicating that experiment number two suggests 10% more likely to predict temperature below zero degrees Celsius. Another important, um, interesting point to look here is that the experiment number one is the probability is more polar inland and the probability for the experiment number two are more close to the coast. So that's something that 
both of them are not, not, not being consistent, why putting the location more or more likely to have the zero dB isotherm more inland compared with the experiment number two. Now we, we switch variables um, just to have a different comparison here. We this is the control forecast for the sea level pressure. And what we're starting here is the location and the, the final intense, at least for that time, the intensity of, of this of this cyclone. So we're gonna keep with this isobar, um, the 1004. And when we compare this with two different ensemble members, again, those are random ensemble members, uh, where we are serving here for the experiment number two, sorry, number one. Uh, we have the contour forecast that is a black line, and we have the pink that is going to be more close to the to the surface. And the and the the blue ensemble member that there also seems to be consistent um, with the contour forecast. But when we compare the experiment number two, we are observing a different complete scenario here. We are observing first that the pink ensemble member is more intense, it's a little intense cyclone. And close to the surface, and the blue ensemble member is creating a weaker cycle and further away from the coast or away from the coast. So, again, this uh, to have a better first, first, a better view, we plot all of the ensemble members, and it's really hard to visualize what is going on. So, I'm gonna help a little bit here. So. Here, this assembled member uh, over here, that is more uh, smaller, and they're predicting a weaker but faster movement of the cyclone. But the one over here, this one that I'm putting right here, are predicting a weaker but slower cyclone. So this is the, uh, um, and for the experiment number two, we are seeing something similar. Those assembled members over here is, are weaker and faster, and the ones over here, weaker and slower. So this, why this is suggesting, or what we can uh, can say from this plot, is that these providing is these assembled are providing different scenarios about where the, the location and the intensity of the cycle. So we, we proceed then to a different uh, to observe a different analysis. We compute the mean and the standard deviation. The contour line represents the mean. And the shallow areas represent the standard deviation. So what we are observing here, um, and, and the mean solar pressure for, for the experiment number one seems to have a slightly larger area, but it's not very huge. Um, but compared with this experiment number two, the area for this isobar is a little smaller. But when we compare the variance, again, we are observing similar patterns um, that the standard deviation of the variance for this level pressure is rather over the area of interest, um, and the, the variations are also larger over that region compared with the experiment number one. And again, since we are selecting the entire domain, that is why the variance that we are observing here, and something that is missing in the experiment number two. So we proceed to estimate the probability to predict to the pressure below 1,005 ethopascal. So what we're we seeing here, is the evolution of the, the that probability using this three tool. And the first thing to notice is at 6 UDC, we are having at least a 10% increase of probability to have a similar pressure below 1,005 ethopascal, something that is missing in experiment number two. That could be because maybe we have external influence of our clinic influence that is contributing to the development of the cyclone, or that, that the experiment number one is predicting a faster development of this cyclone. So now if you take a look just at the final time, um, we observe that at the final time, the experiment number one have higher probabilities to predict lower pressure below of 1,005 ethopascal. But just to have a better view of that, we estimate the difference between them. So this is where it's saying that this red area, that the experiment number one is predicting, or at least it's 20% more likely to predict sea level pressure below of that three hole, this hole. And the blue areas over here is the experiment number two that is more likely to have 
uh, to have a similar pressure below 1,005. So just a comparison between the two variables that we have been talking about, the isotherm and the isobar. So we have here two different scenarios and how we can use this information to create a forecast for that event. So here we have in our experiment number one that the peak um, example member is far closer to the coast and also because of that it's affecting a little bit to the, to the inland, the isotherm. And for the experiment number two, because we have an intense design, the pink example member is an intense cyclone and, and close to the coast is also pushing or might be pushing the isotherm further inland. So this is uh, something that the location of the cyclone and the intensity of the cyclone could be um, having an uh, influence or contributing to the location of the isotherm. So we are just seeing here just different scenarios that could be useful. Um, so to compare a uh, different um, variable, um, here is the total accumulated precipitation. We have the mean to the right and the standard deviation to the left. We are observing similar pattern, um, larger variance and larger abrupt area over the east coast of US. So we estimate the probability for two different trees pulled here for larger than 0.1 inches and larger than 0.5. So again, we are observing similar pattern. Experiment number one tend to have higher probability for those three pool, something that we are missing over this area here, and this is way higher for experiment number one. And for these three small, larger than 0.5, um, we have smaller probabilities in the area that we have higher for the experiment number one. So maybe you were wondering, how does it compare with the real observations? So when we compare with what was observed that day, we are saying something very consistent with a probability or estimate of probability. So that's suggesting that the output that we are getting here is, um, it could be useful for using the real time um, and to produce um, weather forecast. So the last variable to analyze here would be then we need um, a T meters. And to be, the, the threshold that we are using here to be to produce wind larger than 20 knots. So this is the evolution for 24 hours. And what we are observing here, again, that at least for this time, the one that for here, experiment number one have tend to have higher probability compared with experiment number two. So when we continue seeing the evolution, there seems to be very consistent for that reason. At the final time, we're going to estimate the difference of them just to see which one is producing and which area is producing larger than the other. So the difference, these are the difference at the final time. And as we already discussed before, the red area represents that experiment number one are more likely to have larger weights than 20 knots. And the blue area is the experiment number one that is tend to have um, higher probabilities to predict with it larger than 20 knots. So with that, I'm gonna divide this, this into the, and split these into different sections. And the first one will be um, what we have developed here. So we have created a sample equation system using the singular vector of the world model. And this is the first time ever that world assembly is generated using this singular vector technique. So we also have created an experimental post-processing product that have been that to show or reveal the spread in the model variables as well as the estimated probability using different principal instances. And we did that for different variables that we observed, the precipitation, severe pressure, wind speed, and temperature. Third, this system in two hours can generate at least um, 11 assembled members after three iterations, and this is something that could be used for all the American family insurance <laughs> company. And last, this technique has been successfully implemented using the Amazon Web Services. The second part uh, would be the key takeaway of this project. And the first one would be that the singular vector of growth rate is case dependent, so probably we're going to see a different scenario by comparing or analyzing a different event. And the second point here would be for the initial condition, sorry, initial indication, initial, initial participation, short, robust forecast spread from mean latitudes 
and less spread for tropical weather system. And that me that could be because two different reasons. One, one is because we are having incorporated the moisture variable into the energy norm. And second, because we are using our very poor resolution. We are talking about 90 kilometers. So for the next steps of this project, we divided five different um, steps. The number one will be to apply the probability skill score using the right skill score or the ranked probability, probability skill score. The second one would be to create a real time initial conditions example prediction system for AOS service using this model. Number three would be to explore the benefits of incorporating the moisture, as I mentioned before. And number four would be to downscale these 30 kilometers and compare with the observation or the result that we already got just to see how. The spread, the, how the spread compare by using a coarser solution with a finer solution. And finally, for my PhD dissertation, would be to apply this technique to study the predictability of, the, the, of developing African, African Esterly Wave and Tropical Cyclone. So before concluding this, I would like to say thank you to all the people that have been there supporting me and guiding me through in this process. Um, Dr. Michael, um, for being there for me. Feed um, the, the people from the committee, my committee members, Morgan Labs and the Hack Impact Group, group for the feedback and insight for the, my research project. Angel is my mentor for 10 years now. And if you're wondering why I call him Mama Dog, you're free to ask him later. <laughs> um, my two close friends right now, Alexandra and Rosa, they have been there um, throughout the, all the highs and lows of my career. And finally, my family, um, my biggest support. and. And also, let's just agree that my niece looks exactly like me, okay? So, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. <laughs> yes? So, in your, uh, your particular emphasis in early slides, you had a region over like South Texas, Mexico, that was also lighting up in a larger model. Mm -hmm. Would you be able to, instead of just picking the region that's like in that region of interest, could you pick like regions that light up in that in that larger run and see whether or not like if you if you had both of those regions in your uh, single vector analysis, if, if you would get you think to apply uh, to select multiple regions. Yeah, because you have. Um, that's an interesting thought. I don't think. I mean, I would have to think more about that. I haven't read anything in the in the, in the literature review, so I'm not sure how this is gonna work. I'm not gonna say no because I'm no 100 percent sure. I probably it's something doable. So it would be interesting to to read more about it. Yeah. Yeah. On uh, can you tell us where you get that word from and what does it mean to you? I do. So, excuse me, I didn't understand the question. Hmm? I didn't understand the question. Can you repeat it? E I G E M. I'm not so sure why you're saying. Eigenvalue. Yeah? Eigenvalue, yeah. Right. Where did you get that word from, Eigen? And what does it mean to you? It's just a way to estimate the largest row of the perturbations. Yeah, but where do you get the boost from? It's, it's just a technique that has been used in the linear algebra. Yeah, but it's not a good English word. Excuse me? It's not a good English word. It is now. No, it's not. It's a German, German word, but how did it get into the English I'm not sure they were going to talk about that in linear algebra. I'm not sure they really explained that when you go through linear algebra, at least they did when I took it. Okay, I have just a, a very basic question. I, I was really intrigued by the small order of magnitude of the initial perturbation. And yeah. I was just wondering kind of how how you choose that and kind of how sensitive is. I mean, you clearly show that it has a response, but is that kind of where you start or do you test different oh, yeah, orders of um, magnitude? These are the rod, uh, the rod um, perturbation. So this is the tangent linear model output. So I haven't scaled the perturbation here. I see. Okay. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. Okay. Yeah.
my question, I think related, but it's almost certainly more naive. Uh, well, it's really naive. How long do you have to run your tangent linear model before you sprout the right singular vectors that are going to lead to the biggest growth? Does it really, do you have to go 24 hours? What, what if you stopped at six or 12? Yeah, that's something interesting. We can stop at six, 12, or we, yeah, or 24. Yeah, we can select the time that we're gonna um, calculate this single vector. In fact, we can calculate a single vector for six hours and continue running the nonlinear integration for longer period of time. Okay. Because it would be still useful to see the spread after the six hours that we use here. Yeah, because I mean, the reason, the motivation for my question is, mm -hmm. I think you'd feel more confident that you can make a tangent linear approach to a six hour segment of the yeah. forecast trajectory, yeah. right? And would that not give you more confidence in what you grow in those six hours as a singular vector? I don't know if you would, if it would or not. We but if that's true, then bringing that to the tropics, yes. including the complication of condensation heating, might be a way to cheat a little bit. We haven't tested that a short period of time, but we are planning to do it because for the operational forecasting, it will be useful for to calculate this for a short period of time because it would be a less computer uh, it would be less expensive to compute yeah and it would be easier to apply or constantly apply on um, these to produce forecast but yeah that's something that is not fun to keep looking okay at, at. i have two questions um i guess i kind of want to along with angela's question uh have you noticed, if you look vertically, where the perturbations are? Do you see any mm. noticeable difference of larger yeah. perturbations at surface? That's a good question. Um, I haven't done this with this case, but the tendency is to show the uh, field paraclinic structure that is very commonly observed. Yeah, so it will be tilt. The two, two, yeah. Yep. So, so what was the temp? So I'm, I'm wondering how the temperature perturbation compares to the uncertainty of the temperature in the model because there's so it's such a small perturbation, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so what was the question? Yeah, just how. So I was wondering what the magnitude of the uncertainty temperature uncertainty is in the model and like how that compares magnitude wise to perturbations that you introduced. So we. We use the perturbations that every that were computed, but we use the a scale factor that we have certain here to have a meaningful spread in the forecast. So we we have to scale the the those perturbations. Can you explain? I don't understand that. Can you explain that to me? So we this is our we try um a scaling factor. We select for this case we select around fifty, and we use the the singular values that were computed uh, with this technique to a scale or this perturbation that we're serving here. So all the perturbations are scaled in the same way. Okay. So what's the magnitude of the perturbation relative like? Um, I should have known that because it just show every time that I plot something, but I, from the top of my head, I don't remember, but I can just come back to you and show you um, when I apply the, the, the scaling factor, how big they look like. Any other questions?